easy bike back from Nationals down south and I thought this would be a good time to show you all like, the little things that we do to try and make our bikes as aero as possible. Um, I've kind of got all these tips from like all the boys on the team over the last two years and then this bike has completely changed since I started but when I first built it between it is now. So I thought I'd show you the five best things that you can do to your bike that aren't going to break the bank to make it as aero as possible. Alright, so the first upgrade I made was going one by. I did it about four or five months ago now. And all you have to do to go one by is you can run it on pretty much any crank. Some of them on the Shimano ones you have to make a little cut, but you can buy these um, one by rings specifically just for one by, so you can't shift on them. Um, from LA Express, they cost about 100 New Zealand dollars, and if you want them to get you to you within pretty much under two months, you've got to pay like $30 shipping, which isn't too bad. It's about 130 bucks. This is a 54 tooth. And then I also have a 58 tooth as well, which is a pretty big dog. Now the fundamental reason behind going one by and getting rid of the front chainring is most time trials are fairly flat and you shouldn't have to go into the small chainring anyway, so it's just taking up space. It's just a, another derailleur to get in the way of the wind and then another chainring to get in the way of the wind. And it also means when you're running a bigger chain ring, and it also means that you've got better gear ratios. And to explain that, normally you'd have a 53 11, and then on the flat, when you're going quite hard onto a tailwind, you would be cross chaining from the 11 right at the bottom to the 53. When you run a 54 or even a 58, when it's really humming, you're going 60k an hour, the chain's a lot straighter, which means it's a hell of a lot more efficient in the drive chain. So that's kind of the reason behind it. I've only ever run the 58 once. You have to be pretty fit and um, pretty good to ride them. 54 is a good medium. It's just like that one tooth more. You can still climb on it fine. Um, I've only got a 20, 28 on here at the moment. What I would like to do is put an 11 to 32 on here, which gives you a few extra climbing gears and stuff when you are cross training, um, if there are a few um, climbs on the course. But yeah, one by is definitely the go for TTs at the moment. The next major upgrade I made, it doesn't seem like a major upgrade, but for me, I never even had a bottle cage on this um, bike. So I got this, um, I think it's an Elite Chrono CX Aero bottle, so it's obviously Aero and it kind of goes with the frame. It has a carbon bottle cage, and we've also mounted it quite a lot lower. Most bottles would kind of sit, I guess, around here on the bike, whereas when I clip mine in, so then theoretically it kind of like gets rid of all the space down here where a normal bottle with a wind would hit the bottle, go over, back down and then out the frame. It really smooths the airflow through here. So um, that was a little upgrade I made. It's not too expensive. I think the bottle cage and the bottle are about 90 to to $100 um, in New Zealand wherever you find them. So not a terrible upgrade and obviously it's a lot faster than just having a normal bottle. Um, or no bottle at all, I think it even might be faster than just no bottle. Alright, another important one is um, stack height. Getting on board with the modern day aero bars and aero positions. Obviously back in the day everyone had their base bar and then the aero bars just slammed onto their base bar as low as possible, which um, created a massive gap. I put up a photo, I think it's of um, Cadell Evans in the B on this BMC, absolutely slammed. Like that position now, is just unheard of in the pro peloton and even in like club racing and stuff you would never ever ever be that low i've probably got almost three inches of stack here which is crazy and these aren't expensive to make all you got to do is work out what type of bolts you have how big the holes need to be and how it um, attaches to your aero bar and all you have to do is take it to an engineer with the exact specifications you want and then the engineer will just build these out of alloy take them home give them a black spray paint and then they're just good to go whack them on your bike and it's so so much faster and basically what that's doing is bringing your arms up as close to your face as possible to try and get the air to hit there and then back over your aero helmet so super super cheap i reckon if you went to the right engineer they'd be able to make these in absolutely no time and probably only cost you under a hundred dollars as well. The next thing that I've done um, recently, over the years I've slowly been changing my crank length. So at the moment I'm running a 165 crank. I'm just under six foot tall to put that in perspective. Glenn's over six foot tall and Ari's like six two and they're all running 165 cranks and the idea behind it is to open up your hip angle and also in turn with that you kind of have to run your seat on a negative angle and it really opens up your hip flexors and everything and basically this tries to combat that. I didn't really believe it when I first started because obviously when you first start riding everyone's just on 172.5 cranks and then I dropped to 170s in like 2019, 2020 and 170s worked really well for me. I've still got 170s on my road bike. And then um, Glenn really, really suggested that I went to 165 for the TT bike. So I got a pair of these x -Gays. I'm pretty sure this power meter only costs like 700, 600, 700 bucks. Pretty cheap one. All I was going to use it for was put a one by ring on 
and just live on the TT bike so it's not like an all wheeler crank. And yeah, I think it's been a really good choice. I've been able to put my seat up a little bit more, obviously come up with my bars and everything. So my position, which is obviously all in all, all of this is to make your position better on the bike. The most important thing you can do is get a good position on your time trial bike and all of this is trying to trying to combat that and make it as comfortable as possible to make. And make me be able to produce the most speed for the least amount of power on the TT bike. Yeah, crank length is definitely something that everyone should consider. So yeah, everything on this bike has pretty much been done on the cheap. I've got the whole frame, fork, base bar, and these Jure's um, brake levers for 850 New Zealand dollars, so pretty cheap. And then obviously I've got it painted and stuff for a video. Um, and then I put Altegra DO2 11 speed on it. Um, this disc is amazing, I think he only paid like 600 bucks for it. Uh, this front wheel would be worth only about, I think I got it off George, uh, if you're just counting the front wheel, $300. And then obviously Glenn made me the bars, uh, the saddle's probably worth maybe 100 bucks. So like all in all, I'd be, say I'd less than $3,000 in on this bike, maybe $3,500. For like, this is a pretty seriously good national level um, TT bike. Anyone could jump on this and go fast. It's definitely not going to hold you back. And it's only, you know, I've only spent three, three and a half thousand dollars. And the, the idea of tinkering with your time trial bike is actually so much more exciting than just going out and buying a $25,000 Cervelo P5 with a new disc and an 808 front wheel and a Dura SDI2 that's going to cost you so much money. And it isn't actually going to make you a hell of a lot faster. It's better to kind of work your way into it and just work out what works for you and just tinker with it and like spend that money slowly over time. And that's kind of what I've done with this to the point now where I'm super, super happy with this bike. But yeah, obviously this never ends. Like you're constantly trying to upgrade and get as fast as you can. So the next two things that I'm gonna be doing to the bike to make myself faster and a lot of research has gone into this um, and Glenn's been testing it and stuff as well, is that I'm gonna get myself a new disc this one here is completely flat, so as you can see both sides are flat and it doesn't have a fairing on it. So I'm going to get a disc that kind of bows out because it seems to be a lot faster in the tunnel and, and, and all the testing that people have been doing. So a disc that flows out, it's a little bit wider and there's a clincher that I can run as tubeless because tubeless has been testing the fastest at the moment. Tubeless used to be the fastest, the uh, Corsa Speed still a fast tyre but they're so hard to get in and it's getting more and more expensive. And then the same with the front, I might drop from, this is obviously a 75, but I might drop to like a 60 or a 65 that has a wider um, wider profile and then also run clincher tubeless on the front. So that's kind of like the two next things that I think will kind of elevate the bike, but obviously um, that's going to be a couple grand. So as I have it at the moment, it's still a pretty fast bike and I'm pretty happy with it. But yeah, if you did enjoy this bike breakdown type video, I have a lot of bikes that we could also break down and show you kind of the, the custom things that I do and why I do them. Let me know in the comments below, but if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you are new.